Magic the Gathering can be easily argued as the most complicated trading card game ever created, but it's surprisingly easy to understand once you know the basics. Welcome to iBlueAir JGR. On my YouTube channel, I've always made it a point to make every video accessible to gamers whether they play the game that's being featured or not. In today's video, we're going to go over some Magic the Gathering basics that will help clear up the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay that you'll see in my Magic the Gathering Arena videos. This isn't a complete guide of all the crazy things that exist in Magic, but it will provide you with a foundation to get you in the door. Now let's get started. First, you need to understand how to read Magic cards. Every card in Magic the Gathering has the same set of information on it. Its name, mana cost, type, expansion symbol, and text box. Creature cards also have a power and toughness, which we'll talk about later. The name is self-explanatory. The mana cost is denoted by a number and symbol representative of one or more of the five colors of mana in the game. The logical next question is, how do I get mana? There are cards called land, which can be played once per turn and tapped once per turn to generate mana. The act of tapping is common across Magic the Gathering, and it essentially means you're using the card. Once a card has been tapped, it can't be used again until it untaps at the beginning phase of your next turn. Next up, the card type is where things start to get dense, but it's also where the game starts to come to life. There are six different types of cards. Land, which we just talked about, are used to generate mana. Creatures are your fighting force. There are many different subtypes of creatures like humans, goblins, or pigs, but they all function in the same way. They have a name, mana cost, type, expansion symbol, text box with a description of their abilities or effects, and power and toughness. Their power, the number on the left, represents how much damage they deal, and toughness represents how much damage they can take before they die. Artifacts and enchantments are similar types of cards in that they enter the battlefield and provide constant effects for you, your opponent, or something on the battlefield. On the flip side, sorceries are spells that provide a one-time effect. Finally, instants are spells that can be cast at any time, even during your opponent's turn. They provide one-time effects like counter spells, buffs, debuffs, removal, etc. Now, I want you to keep the idea of instant cast spells that can be cast at any time in your mind, because now we're going to talk about the makeup of a player's turn. Each player's turn is broken into phases that keep things organized and limit the type of spells or actions that can be taken. You have your beginning phase, main phase, combat phase, second main phase, and ending phase. In the beginning phase, you untap everything on your battlefield that's tapped and activate any abilities that are supposed to activate during your upkeep. During your main phase, you can cast sorceries, creatures, artifacts, enchantments, and activate abilities. Also, both you and your opponent can cast instants during main phases. From there, we go to the combat phase. During the combat phase, you can still activate abilities, but you can no longer cast sorceries, artifacts, enchantments, or summon additional creatures, unless they have special effects. However, you can still cast instants. The main purpose of the combat phase is to declare what creatures of yours will be attacking. Once that's done, your opponent can declare their blockers. Then, damage is dealt based on the power of attacking creatures. Attacking creatures that are blocked will battle against each other, and the creatures with the right amount of power and toughness will survive. Once combat is done, you go to your second main phase, then finally, your end step. Now, I totally understand that I just dumped a lot of information on your lap, but don't worry. We're going to make it all make sense by going into an actual game of Magic the Gathering Arena, and we're going to talk through everything slowly. All right, for the purpose of explaining how to play Magic the Gathering, we're going into a bot match, so I'm going to take things very slowly, and we are going to get a grip and understanding of how the game works. So I'm going to keep my starting hand. We've got seven cards, and we've got some pretty good cards in our hand as well. The Lanoir Visionary is something I want to get onto the battlefield as quickly as possible, and I need three mana in order to do so. The two is denoting that I need two mana of any color, and then there's a little picture of a forest. That means I need at least one forest mana to summon this guy. So we're going to play out this jungle hollow. This is a special type of land that can function as either a swamp or a forest. But at the end of the day, it's just a land, but it's, it's doing a little bit more. It's okay, don't panic. 
All right, it's turn three, and it's time for us to get our Lanoir Visionary onto the field. So we're going to play that Swamp. Now, you can do this manually, or you can do it automatically, but just to showcase how this works, I'm going to do it manually. I'm going to tap my three mana. So now I've got two Swamp and one Forest, and I can use that to play the Lanoir Visionary. So the mana is going to get spent, and boom, he's on the field. And you'll notice he does have an effect when Lanoir Visionary enters the battlefield, draw a card. And he has a second ability that I can activate by tapping him to add an additional forest to my mana pool. That is a temporary forest. It is only active for a single turn, but it is still incredibly valuable. Now, I am currently being attacked by this guy. I'm just going to call him the Wayfinder. And his power is two. His toughness is one. And I can choose to block him with the Lanoir Visionary. And just for example's sake, I'm going to do that. And in doing so, both of our creatures are going to die. Or maybe my creature is going to die and his is going to survive. Because he just activated a whole bunch of instant cast spells. And absolutely destroyed the Lanoir Visionary in the process. So that is an example of somebody using an instant basically whenever they want and that's something that we we talked about initially so it's my turn once again and i drew a mana so i'm gonna play it and i do want to have something to defend myself against the wayfinder on the battlefield so i'm going to play my favorite card in the whole wide world the truffle snout he's got a cool ability when i summon him i can choose between two different effects i can either gain four life or put a plus one plus one counter on him and I'm going to choose that second effect to make him even stronger. So I'm going to call him the Super Truffle Snout now because he's just, he's, he's super. He's awesome. Anyway, we're going to play, play another mana, and this time I'm going to play the Cultivate Sorcery. So unlike Instance, remember, sorceries cannot be played at any time. They can only be played during main phases. So Cultivate, I get to search my library for up to two basic land cards. I put one on the field tapped and the other one in my hand. So I'm going to take the forest and put it on the field and I will bring the swamp to my hand. And I'm not going to attack. I'm just going to keep the Truffle Snout on the field as a deterrent against the Wayfinder. Now, something for me to keep in mind, and this is a little bit metagame, is that he's attacking me probably because he has an instant cast spell in his hand that he can use to make the Wayfinder stronger than the Truffle Snout. But just for the purpose of showing what that might look like, we're going to block it. There you go. So once again, the power and toughness of the Wayfinder was greater than that of the Truffle Snout. All right, well, at this point, my hand is filled with a whole bunch of stuff, and I have the resources available to me to cast all of it, but I'm at the point now where I just have to think about what exactly I want to do. So I suppose I'll start off by casting the Beanstalk Giant, but he has a special effect. He has a dual functionality. I can use him as a sorcery first and then summon him later. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to search my library for a basic land card and then put it onto the battlefield and then I shuffle my library. And then I'm going to do it again because I had two Beanstalk Giants in my hand. So we'll just bring out another forest. So now I have a crazy amount of mana on my battlefield right now. And the Beanstalk Giant, his power and toughness is equal to the number of lands I control. I currently have nine. He's very tough. I'm going to get attacked here and I'm just going to take all the damage. I do have these instant casts, these fully growns, but using them on his creature would obviously be a bad idea fully grown target creature gets plus three plus three until end of turn and you put a trample counter on it i don't want to give that to an enemy creature that would be silly anyway i think it's time for us to play another jungle hollow but also to get the beanstalk giant on the field he costs six mana of any color and then plus one additional forest i'm just going to let it auto play this time so the game will tap the appropriate amount of mana for me and then summon the Beanstalk Giant. Autoplay works most of the time. Sometimes you don't want to autoplay your mana. Sometimes you want to do it manually. But in general, autoplay for mana tapping is the safe way to go. 
So we've got a generous stray. When generous stray enters the battlefield, draw a card. I don't think that's going to do anything to stop the beanstalk giant. So why don't we just finish this off? Just for the sake of showing how the mana can work again. I'm going to tap two swamps and a forest. Now you see we have three mana available to us. I'm going to use fully grown. Two mana of any color so that's going to consume the swamps and then one forest is required and we'll put that on the beanstalk giant and then we can of course do the same thing again because i have another fully grown in my hand so we'll make this guy as thick as humanly possible and we can actually make him a little bit thicker by playing a cultivate i'm not going to auto play i just want to show you guys how the mana works so we spent our mana to cultivate and now we can choose two land cards from our deck. And there we go. We've got an 18-18 Beanstalk Giant on the field. It's going to attack. Let's see what he does. He is going for the block. So because this guy has 18 power and 18 toughness, the Generous Stray is obviously going to get obliterated. But how is that going to work? The Generous Stray has one power. That's going to deal one damage to my 18 toughness which is going to bring it down to 17. My 18 power is going to bring his two toughness down to negative 16, so it's going to die. And there it is, man. That's Magic the Gathering for you. It's not difficult, but there is a lot of information to take in initially. But once you know all of the basics and you know what an enchantment is and the sorcery and an instant and how each of those things are different and you know about creatures and combat and power and toughness, once all of that stuff sinks in, playing the game is actually pretty simple and a hell of a lot of fun. So hopefully if you do enjoy my Magic the Gathering videos, this will help you make more sense of what's going on as I play through the game. Of course, I do try to explain things as best as possible. I will read out the effects on cards as quickly and reasonably as possible because sometimes cards have really long descriptions. But overall, it's a good time, man. So stop by, watch me play some ranked in Magic and potentially get my ass kicked or do some of the ass kicking.